<laughs> it's my show now. Well, thank you for joining me today, Josh. Yeah. Here on Room 6, we're going to... No, 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 no. I suppose no, you wonder I why I called you all here today. Right on. So, so right Josh, on. tell me about yourself. <laughs> well, I... I try to do interviews and people tend to d derail them. No. <laughs> so, so Timothy. I try. This video is brought to you by Puzzle Master. We'll hear more about them in a bit, but for now, let's get on to today's video. Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to local music wherever it may be found and the people that make it, including me. I'm Josh, and today my guest is a musician who specializes in bringing chill island vibes to your event, courtesy of his instrument. Uh, he plays everything from pool parties to international expos. He's also been a gamer, radio personality, and more. Please welcome to the channel, Timothy Connolly, a.k.a. Ukulele Hero. Hey, Timothy. Hello there, Josh, and welcome to Room 6, everybody out there who's watching and or listening to room six cool you want to take it away go ahead it's your show now <laughs> it's my show now well thank you for joining me today josh here on room six we're going to no 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 i suppose no, you wonder why i called you all here today right on so so right josh on. tell me about yourself <laughs> well i i try to do interviews and people tend to derail them no <laughs> so so timothy try yes so right off the bat, you have a, a nickname, which it's actually in my notes. You, you mentioned it during off camera, but um, you have a nickname, Sonny Calzone. Can you talk, tell, you know, when do, does he ever make an appearance during your act or because that seems like a name straight out of, you know, old school Vegas. I could see that being something Andy Kaufman would have done. But the, the honest truth is I've never used it as a stage name. <clears throat> Although some folks who I communicate with by email, they receive emails from me <clears throat> and it says you've got an email from Sonny Calzone. It doesn't say from Timothy Connolly. Anyway, long story about that. It's just a nickname of mine from the old neighborhood in New York City where uh, I was a troublemaker when I was a kid. Kind of like, uh, sort of like Santino Corleone from the Godfather film, <clears throat> um, who was Sonny Corleone. Uh, played by James Kahn, as everybody knows and loves. Um, but um, and I also love calzones, so <clears throat> it became Sunny Calzone. Um, not much of a story to it there, really. I suppose that's all there is to it. But it stuck with me as a nickname over the years. I've kept it as the email address that I've had forever now, it seems. And um, so that's really all there is to it. No big mystery. I'm so sorry if that's anticlimactic, but I can't be anything less than honest with you, my dear sir. Oh, so formal, but thank you very much. Uh, yeah, when I saw the um, the confirmation email come through, it said from Sonny Calzone, but then it said Timothy Connolly. So I was like, okay, I got to ask. I have to look into that. So fair question. By Maybe the way, it was my alter ego. Yeah, one never knows. One never knows. By no, the way, but really, honestly, that's all there is to it. Um, just a silly little thing that I've kept from uh, yesteryear. Nice. Never get to um, use the word yesteryear and in. in in day-to-day -day parlance. It's so nice to just whip that one out. So thank you for the opportunity. No, no problem. Uh, by the way, if you want to be like Sonny and be on the channel, whether reviewed, interviewed, or both, hit me up using my email address down below in the description or click the Room 6 social media link. That's where you'll find all the ways you can support the channel, what I do here, find me online, and, and other things I'm up to. Um, also, you know, like, share, and subscribe, all those YouTube things. Now then, back to you. So I have a couple of my usual interview questions uh, mixed in here, uh, and uh, OG Room Sixers will, will recognize these as, as they come up. And uh, if you've seen any of my interviews, maybe you will too. So I want to talk about your earliest musical influence. Now, you, you're known pretty much for playing ukulele. Did you, um, what is that earliest musical influence you remember going like, what's that earliest memory where you said, I want to do that? Great question. I don't think that there was ever a single moment in my life where I decided I'm going to choose music as a path for myself. I believe in my heart that it's the other way around and that music chose me. And right from the early 1970s, when I was exposed to my parents' wonderful vinyl record collection, that was where my love of what we think of today as classic rock really started to take hold and take root. Dad was into the Stones and the Who and Led Zeppelin, 
Mom was into the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Donovan and Doobie Brothers and just so many bands. I mean, it's such a long list of, of bands uh, that I was exposed to through their vinyl records. I eventually ultimately got a turntable of my own when I was a teenager and I had some records myself too. And um, so that's about how far back I can trace it, where music and me collided and more or less became one. I went on to become a singer, which I was professionally in New York City for about 25 years, actually more than 25. And then after that, I transitioned away from singing to become a, a string instrument person. Picked up a little bit of guitar, but not much, and mostly picked up the ukulele, which was given to me as a gift by one of my bandmates in New York back around, I want to say, 2008. Sometimes when we would just have, you know, band campfire jams, getting together, writing songs, rehearsing music, whatever it was, we would bust out the acoustic instruments around the campfire, and I would bust out the ukulele, not really knowing what I'm doing, but at first taking my little baby steps with it, and that was 2008. And now fast forward ahead, all these years later, 16 years by uh, my math, if I am correct. Um, now here I am in New York. I mean, uh, from New York, rather, in Las Vegas and no longer singing, but still connected with music very much so. And I used to think of myself as a musician, but I now think of myself as music. That's really what it all boils down to for me. And being able to have the opportunity to not just do the private parties and the weddings and the corporate events, but also to get out there into the public a little bit more. Here we are now in the middle of June. And uh, one amazing uh, show that I have coming up that I think everybody should mark down in their calendars is going to be Saturday, August 24th. I will be doing two full sets of Led Zeppelin music at the Voodoo Brewing Company, which is in the Arts District, and it is a great location. And I am going to be performing at the Voodoo Brewing Company a few times this year. But the big one right now on the calendar is August 24th. It's a Saturday. And uh, let me just see if I can double check the show times. And yes, it's going to be 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. So you can come on down. It's a free show and it's all ages. Um, so anybody can come on down and enjoy some good old Led Zeppelin. Now, there won't be any vocals. It'll just be me, my Fender tenor ukulele, my 15 watt acoustasonic fender amp with a built-in chorus knob and my fender quarter inch cable and that's all you're going to get um, i don't use loops i don't use effects pedals i don't try to use too much electronics because of my severe hearing loss i have a hypersensitivity to emf radiation so anything i can do to to uh, err on the side of caution i try to do so you're just going to get me my amp and um, yes, a chorus knob, but no effects like distortion or anything like that. It's just nice with Italian strings. I use strings from a, a company in Italy called Aquila. They make, they make this wonderful new strings that are a combination of nylon and cat gut together in the same string. Brand new string technology called Nile gut. And this one, I guess you could say model of theirs that I'm using currently. I change once every year. I change the strings and put on new. I'm currently using a model of theirs called the Red Series, where they sprinkle copper particles into the string during the manufacture process. So the strings take on a sort of reddish color from the copper. And the copper particles in the string, they help to suppress a lot of the sustain that you might get from a string if it didn't otherwise have metal particles in it. So the purpose of the copper particles in the red series strings is to give the strings a bit more uh, of a, a deeper tone, deeper resonation, and uh, again, not so much sustain. So it almost becomes a bit more percussive. It's hard to explain. Um, again, not overly so uh, with the percussion element of it when playing it. But uh, my style is also not rhythmic. I don't really do too much of that sort of, of uh, ukulele play. I don't do the, the down, down, up, up, down, up, island strum, calypso strum, any of the more common popular ukulele strums. I'm self-taught. And what I do is I play melodically instead of rhythmically. 
So for me, you'll never see a pick being used, and you'll always see me using all 10 of my fingers. Um, I'll even use my thumb exclusively to form a D major chord. Um, it's a little bit unusual and unorthodox to watch someone like me play. And it surprises me sometimes when folks approach me and say, hey, do you teach? Well, prior to this year, I didn't teach, nor did I want to. I was of two minds on that. The first mind was, if you want to learn how to play the ukulele, you should do one of two things. A, find a proper instructor who can show you music theory and all of that stuff, circle of fifths and all that stuff. I don't have a grasp on that. I have a, I have a passing, um, I guess you could say, acquaintance with that stuff. Um, but I cannot read nor write music. So in that respect, you could say I'm just like John Lennon and Paul McCartney, neither of whom could read or write themselves. Now, my gift is to be able to tap into the playing, especially of an acoustic instrument. Because of my deafness, the instrument speaks to me with its vibrations and its intonations, its inflections, and its frequencies. Now, much of the higher end frequencies have been lost to me since age three when I was robbed of my hearing. Both ears gone, same level of loss. Today, I have approximately 10% remaining of my normal healthy hearing from birth. So my relationship with music and sound and vibrations and speech and reality in general is quite different from those who have healthy hearing, who may take their hearing for granted, who probably sometimes wish they could quiet the world, quite frankly, and I get that. But I mostly feel sound. I don't really hear sound. Much of my uh, communication with sound back and forth is use, uh, using touch. Uh, having lost hearing, my other senses have got much stronger, including touch. And I don't just mean fingertips touch. I'm talking about full body skin from head to toe. <clears throat> when I'm near vibrations or sound or noise or speech, uh, my skin takes those vibrations and frequencies and sends the signals to my brain which uh, sort of comprehend it somehow together combined with the hearing aids that I wear. Also, my ability to read lips is very helpful. I've gotten so good at that now, I can just make eye contact with people and use peripheral vision to read lips. Maybe the FBI should reach out to me if they're looking for a lip reading guy with a pair of binoculars. <laughs> um, but as far as the music goes, um, yeah. I'm speaking too much probably, but back to your original uh, question, the music uh, for me goes back to the, to the um, well, as far back as the, the Nixon administration, although I might have to say the, the Jimmy Carter administration was probably when I became most exposed to music and contemporary bands of that time. So we're talking about the second half of the 1970s, bands like Queen for instance, were coming into prominence. And you could hear now what uh, some of the newer uh, music sounded like from bands who had been around for a while. For instance, music that The Who was still releasing in the 1970s was still just as good to me as music they were releasing in the 1960s. But it's all relative, it's all subjective, everyone's got their favorites, and everyone has their moments when it comes to bands. Some bands I tried and I just can't get into. Bands that are considered classic Rock and Roll Hall of Fame bands, pioneers of their genre. For instance, King Crimson is a pioneer of progressive rock, prog rock. Um, King Crimson has a ton of fans. And King Crimson has also changed so much over the years with its lineups. And it's had different eras, usually marked by years of three from 72 to 74 with John Wetton, and then from 75 to, or maybe it was 76 to 78, I think with Adrian Ballou. And prior to that, it was of course, Robert Fripp and the original members of King Crimson, who then went off to form other projects. And then members of King Crimson went off to join other projects too. And they started some cool projects like Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Asia, and they teamed up with Steve Howe from Yes and Carl Palmer on drums from Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And it just created this amazing little prog rock family tree. But 
I just can't seem to get into King Crimson. And Josh, I've tried. I've even gone back to listen to some of their very early stuff. Their very first record in the court of the Crimson King is considered one of the foundation pillars of prog rock. And I love me, I loves me some prog rock sometimes, especially if we're talking about Pink Floyd and Genesis and some of those bands and Peter Gabriel's solo stuff too. But King Crimson, I don't know, I've really tried. I think my all-time favorite prog rock band is Rush, quite frankly. I know there are a lot of Rush fans out there. Hi, Rush fans. Hmm. Um, I've been a Rush fan for a long time. It took me a long time to get into Rush, Josh. Um, I don't think I really started getting hip to their music until the second half of the 1980s, which was late for Rush. Because, of course, their heyday was the 1970s. We all know that. Um, once the 80s came around and the, the synthesizers and Getty Lee getting a little weird with experimental now. Um, I don't mind experiment. I really don't. And I'm glad that he went ahead and did that, looking back on it. But come on. My favorite Rush stuff is the early Rush stuff, even though I really became Rush aware in, I want to say, 1988, right around then. That was my senior year of high school, by the way. There were so many cool bands making great music that year. Um, not to mention Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction came out that year. And just when everybody thought heavy metal was dead, along comes Guns N' Roses, uh, which is probably more hard rock, I guess, than metal, looking back on it now. But whatever. It was metal enough for us. I couldn't um, agree more. You feel the same way about GNR? Yeah, just uh, that whole era really was like a switch. Like anytime there's a musical shift or a paradigm shift, there's something about it that's just like, yeah, this makes sense. Why are why hasn't this been a thing? Or, you know, why why did we go away from this? Yeah, it was also, uh, I think the late 1980s was also the twilight of the hair metal bands, right? All of a sudden you stopped seeing, well, I guess right after Warrant and Whitesnake, uh, the hair metal bands were pretty much done. Hair, And then that paved the way for grunge, which then wiped out everything. Just like, I guess, punk rock knocked out good old rock and roll in the late 1970s. Nobody wanted to listen to Led Zeppelin or Queen anymore when they could listen to the Ramones. Yeah, um, right. If but, we can back hey, up for just a second. Know, what's on uh, your mind? Well, I just wanted to ask, you went from East Rockway to Vegas. I did. Were you, were you moved or, or did you move yourself? Uh, in January of 2018, I drove from New York to Nevada. Uh, I drove, took the ride solo. I think it took me 18 days to do it. Uh, with each date I drove through, I would stay with friends who would put me up for a night or two. And it was a great trip. Um, and it was the last time I got to see some of my really good friends, who I'm still really good friends with today, in person. Um, so I'm glad I had that opportunity. And so just like the Corleone family from The Godfather, we're back to this again. When Michael Corleone uh, moved the Corleones from Long Beach, Long Island, New York, to uh, Lake Tahoe in Nevada, he moved the family complex out to Nevada. I also moved. So Sonny, Sonny Calzone also moved from New York to Nevada, just like Michael Corleone. How about that, Josh? Yeah, that that's uh, generally how it works. <laughs> right? I couldn't have planned it any other way. Actually, I didn't even plan it that way. Um, but so, yes, I left East Rockaway. I, well, East Rockaway was where I... I lived until the early 2000s. After that, I bounced around Long Island, living here and there. Lived in Farmingdale for a while. Lived in Glen Cove for a while. And now I'm here in Henderson. And I just can't imagine going back east because of how nice it is here. The weather's great. It's a lot less humidity, which I'm very happy about. My aching joints are very happy about that. I'm an old man now, so, you know, I like the drier climate. And um, the people are so nice. The outdoor parks are so nice. I don't gamble and I don't drink either. So I don't go to casinos or places like that looking for that kind of trouble. Uh, the trouble I look for is uh, just the great outdoors. I love parks. I love to go and look around at the, woody, the wooded areas. And I coach Qigong sessions outdoors in the parks too. I was recently doing the Kellogg's Air Park up in Summerlin, 
and now I'm doing Fridays at Solista Park in Inspirata in Henderson, which is really nice, a lot closer to home to me. And... I was going, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask about the Qigong because uh, I, for a brief period of time, I studied when I was younger. Uh, Did you? I was, That's cool. I, was, I studied some of the martial arts and, and I, you know, started to get into Qigong and also um, Tai Chi. But uh, I was just wondering, like, how <laughs> you went from, like, gaming and, and radio personality and, and you know, music. Uh -huh. how, how'd you get into Qigong? Um that's another thing where I didn't choose Qigong, it chose me. I discovered it um, just randomly in some documentary I was watching on television about 30 years ago that introduced me to it. And no one ever talked about it. And so it sort of became this mysterious, almost Mandela effect thing for me, where I could have sworn I saw something and I start looking around, you know, almost as if to think, you know, hey, you saw that too, right? I'm, please tell me I'm not the only one who just saw this. This sounds amazing. Whatever it is, this ancient holistic healing pathway that, that no one talks about, and why not? So I first became intrigued by it three decades ago. Never thought to pursue it, really. And then uh, around 2006, 2007, I began doing martial arts training with black belts in New York. We would do karate, jujitsu, aikido, and I had some judo training as well from the 1980s that I had tapped into and gotten back into again a little bit. Spending time with the martial arts masters made me realize that I wanted to explore Qigong. I had forgotten about it, but then being uh, with the martial artist, it made me remember about these internal arts that I also wanted to explore. You have your martial arts and you have your self-defense and all that and that world, but Qigong is internal arts and it's a different world. In fact, Tai Chi is martial arts, yet it's also a form of Qigong. It's the martial arts branch of Qigong. Tai Chi is slow motion blocks and strikes when you break it all down. It's self-defense. Speed it up and you can use it to defend yourself in fights. Whereas Qigong, on the other hand, is not about self-defense in that regard, but yet it is self-defense in a different context because what you're doing is you are cultivating and revitalizing your body's internal energies and then using that energy for yourself for healing, to accelerate healing, to combat illnesses, to take care of inflammation, to do what you need to do with that energy. It's yours. It's your chi. And you can use your chi for healing. Your chi is your most, actually, your most powerful tool for healing that your body has. It's even better than your immune system. Your chi is more useful to you as a tool also than your immune system is. Immune system is all subconscious mind, the 90% that we don't control. Whereas the 10% that you can control, the conscious brain, you can take control over your breath, you can control your chi, you can accelerate your healing, tap into the longevity and wellness aspects of the discipline, and you can remember how to breathe, really breathe, like the way you could when you were still two years old, Josh. Remember when you were still two years old? Oh, how you could breathe. All of us, we lose those training wheels for natural, proper instinct of breath by the time we reach age three. Every single one of us does. And our brains never tell us. They never said to you, Josh, you just turned three. Happy birthday, by the way. We're going to take off these training wheels now for proper breath. And we're not going to tell you about it. And no <laughs> one else is. Good luck. Now, Qigong is a way to remember how to breathe. You see, I can teach people. Well, people think I could teach them how to breathe, but I really can't. What I can do is help you to remember how. So let's understand the difference between remembering and learning, right? Big difference. Definitely a big difference. I'm going to try to steer us back towards music, though. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, only be uh, because that's, that's why people are here, hopefully. <laughs> that's so, why we're all here. Music is right. my number one. What would yep. I be without music? Yes. And um, speaking of which, make sure that you check out his social media handles or it links down below so that you can, you know, keep up with him. Maybe if you want to study Qigong or, you know, whatever, 
uh, you want to get into. Means. Or but, maybe if you have a question, just let me know. Right. Before we move on, we're going to take a quick little break and hear a message from future Josh here. So uh, see you in a second. And now a word from our sponsors. Thanks, Josh, from the past. If you're like me, you enjoy the occasional brain stretch as a break from the mundane of everyday life or a way to undo the damage that social media can do to the old gray matter. The other reason I enjoy puzzles is because I have a history of Alzheimer's in my family and I'd really like to avoid that particular problem. Puzzles provide exercise in memory and have been shown to improve short-term memory. Fortunately, Puzzle Master is here to help. Puzzle Master carries a large selection of brain teasers made from wood, wire, metal, plastic, paper, and foam. In addition to these, they carry boomerangs, chess, board games, and much more. Just for watching this video, and for being part of Room 6, and for a limited time, you can use my affiliate link down in the description to get 10% off any order by entering the coupon code 10 dash off. That's 10 hyphen off at checkout. Plus, you'll be helping the channel. Thanks to Puzzle Master for being a sponsor, and let's get back to the show. We're back, and if that sponsor spot interested did you at all, interested did it? <laughs> if that sponsor spot interested you at all, please consider clicking the link down below. You'll save some money. I'll get some money. It's a win-win, baby. Um, stick around. We're going to be doing a couple more questions here. Like I said, if you want to know more about Timothy, uh, what he's up to, what he's doing, where you can catch him, etc., uh, check those. <clears throat> pardon me, check those links down below. And uh, what else? Uh, oh yeah, eat your vegetables. Here we go. So, Mr. Connolly, can we uh, can we talk about suck it easy? Oh, I knew you were gonna go there. What would you like right. to know about suck it easy, my brother? Well, it was a band. That, it wasn't your first band, but it was a band that was. Apparently, kind of, kind of a, a a big deal in in the New York music scene while you were back there. It was indeed, and it was a lot of fun. It was my third band actually, and it started. Sucker Easy Band started in two thousand two. Um, you didn't play ukulele in that uh, one though, right? No, uh, that I was a front man, lead singer, band leader, uh, and impresario. As far as the ukulele stuff goes, that is not anything that I ever performed live for an audience in New York. That would that would always be something just to bust out for fun around the campfire jams and whatnot. That wasn't meant for public consumption. And I wasn't good enough then. When By the time I had left New York, um, I had been technically playing ukulele for 10 years on and off. But I didn't really get into it until 2019, 2020. It's still kind of a new journey for me. And I keep learning more and more with it and becoming more and more confident in my ability with it. It's great. It's been fun. And it's been cool to teach. I've started teaching this year, and I'm glad I finally did. As far as Suck It Easy goes. Yep. Um As I look around my apartment, I have 30, more than 30 framed concert posters from that band. We did so many shows. We recorded six studio albums. We recorded 11 or 12, I think, live concert albums. And um, three of those studio albums ended up on CD in more than 20 countries around the world on six of the seven continents on this planet. Here's a funny story. I found out how to get onto the seventh continent. By the way, would you like to take a guess of what that seventh continent is? The uncharted territory? The final frontier? Ah, uh, the seventh continent. Um, Australia? <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is Antarctica. Now, I was I going to say I, that. Sure you were. I Scouts like honor. that story. Scouts honor. I was. I just was like, no, it wouldn't be Antarctica. All right. Well, I just went and got my little handwritten note that I made uh, years ago. Now, I'm going to hold this up on the screen here, even though I don't think anybody's going to be able to read that because of how small the writing is. But I'll just read it aloud to you. And it says, 
send CDs to Maureen Moses at American Geosciences Institute, 4220 King Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 22302. That, my friend, is how you send snail mail to Antarctica. If you want to send CDs to McMurdo Station, to the scientists who are doing hard work to help save our planet, which was my plan, but I ended up stopping short from doing that, and I just held on to the note as a keepsake and a reminder for me that I have the keys to the kingdom if I ever choose to one day decide to go for that seventh continent and hit all seven with our CDs. Now, only one month out of the year can you send snail mail to Antarctica, and that month is August. So if you're going to be um, in a band, say you're in Las Vegas and you want to send some CDs of your band down to the scientists working hard at Big Birdo Station to help the planet, taking ice core samples and analyzing them and doing whatever it is they do with the data, this is way above my pay grade, Josh. Um, that's how you do it. If you want to send some of your CDs to the scientists in Atlantis, in, I'm sorry, not, I was about to say Atlantis, um, to the scientists in Antarctica, that's how you do it. Um, anyway, I'm not going to repeat the info and I'm not going to hold it up on screen again, but if you would like the info, reach out to me. Consider me your keys to that kingdom. Um, so anyway, the Suck It Easy Band, we uh, broke a lot of ground. We had a split personality. And we were proving to our audiences that, yes, there are still frontiers out there in the music world. Don't let anyone ever tell you that it's all been done before, because that's a lie. We got out there and we proved it time and time again. Case in point, I'm looking at a concert poster right here, right now, from a concert we did called It's the Suck It Easy Band, Charlie Brown. <clears throat> and the poster has Charlie and Snoopy, and it's got... Uh, Snoopy's little uh, little doghouse, you know, that he flies around on uh, when he's the pilot going for the Red Baron. But what's so special about that? We improvised a concept concert. We often did these concept concerts that we would just improvise on the spot. Everyone in the band would know what the basic framework of the theme is before the show, but no one would know the songs. No one would know the song titles, and no one would know what keys musically speaking, that those songs would be in. So what would happen on the day of the show? Everybody would get a list of the songs with song titles they've never seen before in their lives. I'm talking about my bandmates here. Everybody backstage would get what we called the playbook. It wasn't a set list. It was, here's your playbook. Okay, everybody gets their playbook, song titles, boom. Starting keys on the right-hand margin of the page, boom. Everybody knows the names of the songs. Everybody knows the keys. Nobody knows how they go, but we're going to do that on stage and we're going to do it together. Not just with music starting from the rhythm section and taking it from there. Whatever time signature they choose is that's it. That's the time signature for the song. Let's do this. But the audience is also going to get improvised song lyrics that tell a story and propel a narrative forward in the story. In the case of our infamous It's the Suck It Easy Band Charlie Brown concert, the story was. The Suck It Easy Band comes to perform a concert in Charlie Brown's neighborhood, and all the girls get excited about going to see the band perform. But none of the boys do. Not Schroeder, not Linus, not Franklin, certainly not Charlie. None of them. Not even Pigpen who wants to go anywhere near the Suck It Easy Band because, oh, that's that thing that girls like. Cooties! Later in the story, one by one, the Suck It Easy Band keeps playing shows around the neighborhood, and they keep recruiting more and more boys to come out and see the show. But not Charlie. Charlie Brown refuses. He's going to stand his ground and say, that's still that thing that girls like. So, cooties. Eventually, one by one, Charlie caves into peer pressure, and kicking and screaming, he gets dragged to a Suck It Easy Band concert, sees the show, loves it, has a great time. The end. Moral of the story. The Suck It Easy Band is fun for both girls and boys alike. Full stop. That's the whole message. That's it. This is little simplistic stuff, just an example of one way that you can prove to all of the other one-trick pony bands that we were up against at the time. No one was doing what we did. I don't even think anyone had the courage to do what we did on a stage. Improvised concept concerts. 
isn't really something that you would expect from any band unless you're called Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. As it far does, as the it does sound band, a bit ambitious. <laughs> oh, it's very ambitious. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But we recorded those shows. And so we have audio documents of of those concept concerts. And I'm glad that we got out there and, and did all that. There were so many different concepts that we did another favorite one of mine is we all put on zombie makeup one night and we did a special paul is undead beatles night so we did paul is undead with all of us dressed as zombies and we did two full sets of beatles music including and your bird can sing which i don't even think i sang that night one of our other singers did <clears throat> but that was a whole lot of fun uh, we also called it Let It Zombie. That was like our code name for the show. And <clears throat> just another example of things bands can do to be different. Dare to be different, right? Dare to dream, get out there and, you know, of course, don't suppress your own authenticity. Be yourself. You know, never sacrifice that. But at the same time, dare to dream, dare to be different. If you're going to be the artistic type, the creative type, then Feel free to challenge yourself by all means in whatever different direction you want to go. You want to try improv? Go for it. Much of the best music I've heard over the years, Josh, has been improvised. And much of the best music that our band performed over the years was improvised. But again, when I said our band had a split personality, I did mean there were two sides to us. The one side was the improvisational, free-form stuff. The other side was the straightforward 1950s, 1960s, 1970s rock and roll and rhythm and blues and soul review. So you would be getting everything from Buddy Holly to Marvin Gaye and everything in between. Yes, even some Peter Frampton. This is what the Suck It Easy Band could give you. It can give you cover band music, 50s, 60s, and 70s. One set, two sets, three sets. What do you want? You let us know. And then, of course, we would do the improv stuff, the concept concerts. Fantastic journey that I don't think I could have ever experienced with any other band. Certainly not the two bands that I was in prior to the Suck It Easy Band. And, um, you know, bless their hearts. But the Suck It Easy Band was really where I, I think I came into my prime as a performer. And as, as someone who had enough courage by this point to be able to overcome my disability and challenge myself as an artist and become someone who would not just be inspired all the time, but someone who would be inspiring and try to make uh, being an inspiration for others somewhat of a priority, you know? Yeah, yes, it's great totally. to get out there and just do the music, but there was more to it. I had transcended things by a certain level. And once I became a music producer and we had CDs in all these countries around the world and fans here and there and all that, I mean, it got to be too much. And I, and I get it. I get why people don't want fame once they get it. And I get why people are happy to be that one hit wonder living off your royalties and your residuals and go into relative obscurity and maybe go out and sign autographs from time to time at a fan convention or whatever, but mostly just, you know, enjoy the private life. I get it. And some people, on the other hand, are really cut out for fame. And to them, it just comes so naturally. And they thrive on it. And they need it. It's almost like your body craves nutrition. Some people crave fame and are really only sane when they have fame. I know that sounds insane, right? But that I've known people like this. And, uh, no, me too. And it totally makes sense. Um, and all of that makes sense that you just said. In fact, I think that there's some really good lessons in there for like new musicians as well. And, and the, especially the younger ones that are just like, how, you know, how do I keep, how do I just not be some, you know, like everybody else. So thank you very much for that. Um, oh, easily enough. No worries. I want to thank you all for watching and I want to thank you sir for coming on the channel. It's, uh, it's been a great interview and very informative. Definitely check out those social media links down below and if you get the chance to see Sonny, or sorry, Sonny, <laughs> if you get the chance to see Timothy live, yeah. then by all means, go ahead and see him and uh, tell him Room 6 sent you. 
Sir, do you have anything else to add? I want to thank you for doing this for everyone here in the Las Vegas music community. This is great. There is never enough of this kind of thing happening, and I'm so happy to see it happening. One of my favorite things about technology is this. And thanks to you, Josh, I'm glad that we were able to enjoy some time here together today. Much gratitude, my brother. Same to you, and same to you watching. Uh, and uh, yeah, remember to be amazing, and we'll see you in the outro. And uh, yeah, temporarily say goodbye, sir. Hang loose, y'all. I want to thank Timothy Connolly for coming on the channel. It was a great interview, and you definitely need to go check him out live. Uh, other than that, if you want to see more videos like this, please click up here. If you want to subscribe, click over there, and don't forget to ring the bell. And if you want to hear my own music, which is not ukulele music, click over there. Remember to be amazing, and we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say goodbye, Timothy. Goodbye, everybody. See you soon. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba.